Hello and welcome to Lecture 14 of History of Christian Worship Practices. This is John Chilcote, Worship Professor at Nebraska Christian College. Today we're going to start the discussion of Christian worship in the American frontier, the 18th and 19th centuries. The developments that happened in Europe start to evolve as we go to the colonies and to the early American culture. And there's still developments that happen in Europe as well. But at this point, we're going to see what happens in America, really starting to focus and develop our worship culture as we see it today. Worship during the 18th and 19th centuries were evolving because of the age of reason. This was seen as the un age when people started to question things that had always been known as true. They began to question social norms. They began to question um, equality, things like we see in the Americas. They began to question sovereignty. They begin to question slavery. They begin to question um, manifest destiny. There are also ages of enlightenment where people started to believe in their feelings and what they understood to be true beyond the theologies or the disciplines or the teachings of what had been known to be true. There's also an idea of romanticism, right? Uh, this whole new understanding of the world around developed by thought and emotion intertwined uh, instead of just rational thinking. The American Revolution, the expansion into the West and the Civil War all actually played a part in the development of the American worship cultures. And as the America grew and the, uh, the country was developed and established and different parts of the Americas were settled, we see church following in the footsteps and evolving as the America, American people evolved. The shift of human consciousness began to change how we understand God, grace, and the relationship between God and humanity. The roots of frontier worship actually began in England in the 18th century with the Wesley's Methodist movement. There was enthusiastic hymn singing and open-air preaching. John Wesley was an Anglican priest, and he was known for going to the people and bringing the gospel to the people, whether they were in coal mines or on boat docks or in farms. And this was something seen as heretical. And instead of having people come to Mass, come to the Anglican service, uh, which is what would have been seen as appropriate, his brother Charles Wesley is known to be the father of the American or of the hymn and writing over 8,000 different hymns. A couple things that you see with the Methodist movement, they bring Christian teaching to the people, as I said, to laborers, to criminals, even to slaves. There is no one that should be devoid of hearing the gospel just because they couldn't come to church or because they weren't uh, socially acceptable to come to church. Should they be uh, not allowed to hear the Bible? One major component of the Methodist uh, strategy and theology was known as the quadrilateral. Four components. We see scripture. It's the first authority. And it contains the only measure whereby all other truth is tested. You also have reason. It's not a mere human invention. It must be assisted by the Holy Spirit. Third, you have tradition, a link through 1,700 years of history with Jesus and the apostles, or today, over 2,000 years of history. And fourth is experience. We cannot have reasonable assurance of something unless we have experienced it personally. This quadrilateral sounds like a great um, structure to understand theology and understand the world around us, again, developed by Methodism. But we will see maybe in to this day, sometimes uh, scripture loses its place as the first authority and people see reason or experience or tradition as the value that allows them to make their decisions on theology, especially Currently, we see experience of uh, today's culture, and we see things that may be going against Scripture, but the experience and what they think they believe uh, 
according to what the world is telling them around them uh, is maybe going to affect their theology. But for the main point, this is where uh, this theological um, concept or this, uh, this way of looking at Scripture and looking at the world around them was developed through the Methodist movement. George Whitfield, who was a Calvinist, actually was uh, in England and America, and he was a field preacher, and he was the one who inspired John Wesley. He would be preaching in Georgia, and John Wesley would come from England to visit him. And um, George Whitfield is also a friend of Benjamin Franklin, the noted revolutionist in America. So we see this understanding of, of this transition from England to America as they came over, they brought their faith, but they saw new opportunities to share the gospel outside of the traditional uh, Christian gatherings on Sunday mornings. This brought about, this open-air preaching brought about the first Great Awakening in 1730 to 1750, and it was led by Jonathan Edwards. He was a Reformed theologian. He made numerous trips to the eastern seaboard, and he planted the seed for the upcoming Second Great Awakening in America, led by Charles Finney, 1790 to 1840. So Charles Finney was Presbyterian, another Reformed theologian, and one of the most well-known to transition and bring America uh, after the Revolution in before the Civil War into this new Second Great Awakening. You see these pictures here, and I have one more picture just because his eyes are very scary. But he led revivals, mainly in the urban centers and the eastern seaboard, and he urged the audience to pray down a revival for all to respond on their own free will. He made it easy for people to respond by offering an altar call. This whole idea of coming forth and responding was new, and it came out of the Second Great Awakening. It was a new development that was brought on and has been used continually to this day in different traditions. Other notable figures during this time of the Second Great Awakening were Dwight L. Moody and Ira Sankey, Moody of the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, they formed a team that held revivals in America with frequent trips to do the same thing in England. Sankey was asked to lead singing at a YMCA convention in which Moody was in attendance. Sankey wrote the following on how he and Moody initially met. Sankey said, as I drew near Mr. Moody, he stepped forward, took me by the hand, and looked at me with that keen piercing fashion of his, as if reading my very soul. He then said abruptly, Where are you from? Pennsylvania, I replied. Are you married? I am. How many children do you have? Two. What is your business? I am a government officer. Well, said Mr. Moody, you'll have to give it up. And Sankey was too astonished to, to make any reply and Moody went on speaking as if the matter had already been decided. <laughs> Moody says, I have been looking for you for the last eight years, and you have to come to Chicago and help me in my work. So Sankey and his family joined with Moody within a few months, resigning this government position. One of Moody's gifts was his ability to change the worship order on the fly, depending on the crowd. Sankey employed new forms of worship leading, including singing solos and long periods of singing at all at once, at least a half hour or more. He often sang solos backed up by a choir. He utilized many of the popular gospel tunes at the time written by Fanny Crosby, Philip Bliss, and Robert Lowry. So these two movements, uh, these two men leading this movement, actually paved the way in the Great Awakening, started to pave the way for a template for our modern worship where there would be spontaneity you could change songs on the fly you would have a worship set of two or three or four songs you would have a choir and special music one writer said there was something about his baritone voice that was enormously effective 
He had a way of pausing between lines of a song, and in that pause, the vast audience remained absolutely silent. So Moody and Sankey and the Second Great Awakening. I'm going to show you a few pictures now. An interesting example of the Second Great Awakening revivals is seen in Ocean Grove, New Jersey. A group of Methodists bought a one-square-mile plot of land on the beach in New Jersey where a continuous camp meeting, a revival, could be held. Dwight Moody made frequent visits to the site, and the meetings would often top 10,000 people. So a large wooden auditorium was built instead of using an outdoor tent. And they built this entire auditorium in 91 days in the late 1800s. And the meeting of several thousand people still continues every summer. Here's a picture inside. You can see all the seats. All the w they're still wooden, folded seats. See, holiness is the Lord from that revival movement. All of those lights are individual light bulbs that are changed from the ceiling. You pull them up and you change the ceiling. And we actually got a chance to go up in the ceiling. So we're looking down at the, the organ from the grate up in the roof. If we go back, you can see the grate. Um, and they actually allowed us to play this organ. But you can hear uh, this is what the organ sounded like. <laughs> One of the most popular gospel tunes I sang as a child was When We All Get to Heaven. And uh, it was written at this location, actually. Quite a few hymns that were sung during the Second Great Awakening became hymns of the church that were sang all across um, America. Fanny Crosby, one of the most famous songwriters of this time, she was actually blind, and uh, she would visit this camp meeting at the s in the summers as she was growing up, traveling down from Philadelphia. Um, All the way my Savior leads me, blessed assurance, near the cross. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. To God be the glory, and again, when we all get to heaven. You may recognize some of the titles of these songs, or if you would look them up and hear them, I'm sure you would recognize some of them. Again, When We All Get to Heaven was written by uh, also El Eliza Hewitt. And her, uh, her story, she would go and she would teach Sunday school to all these students, all these children that were at the, the camp meetings this summer. Um, she spent many summers in Ocean Grove. And there was a line in the song of When We All Get to Heaven, Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In his mansion, bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all get to heaven, we'll sing and shout for victory. The second verse starts out with the line, as we walk down pilgrim's pathway. And that line forever, I thought, was just a nice metaphor line of growing up as, you know, as a disciple of Christ, as a pilgrim. But it actually is the name of the front of the, of the street in front of the great auditorium. So if we look at this video, I just went to Google and zoomed in on the great auditorium. And we'll go, go to the street view here. <laughs> 
And as you see in the street view, go down here to the Great Atrium, there it is. And we're on Pilgrim Pathway. I'll s scan over here, and you see <laughs> Pilgrim Pathway is listed on the map. So you can imagine at the turn of the 1900s, a parade of Sunday school children marching down singing this song. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout for victory. And now you can also see as we zoom in, you can see these little um, cabins. And these are the actual tents where they had the camp meetings. And these are all still owned and used by families. And they would come out, and it's, it's more of a tradition now. But you can see the wood planks and, a w and the, the wood uh, platform. They'll put a tent over uh, that frame. And then in the back, in the little cabin component, there's a bathroom and a kitchen and that type of thing. So another church uh, auditorium that was built during the Second Great Awakening is the Ryman Auditorium. Originally, it was known as the Union Gospel Tabernacle. And the very first unfinished auditorium was used to hold a tent revival in 1890 in the city of Nashville. The Ryman is actually named for Thomas Ryman. And before again, it was known as the Union Gospel Tabernacle. Uh, Ryman was a successful riverboat entrepreneur who lived in the 1800s and died in 1904. In 1885, he attended a tent revival that was preached by the Reverend Sam Jones, another uh, evangel evangelist uh, traveling preacher of the Great Awakening. So Ryman attended this revival with the intention of actually heckling Reverend Jones, but instead he was converted by the fiery evangelist. So that night, Ryman was moved to construct a great building to serve the cause of faith. In 1892, the Union Gospel Tabernacle was declared complete. Ryan had gener generously used every means possible to make the venue a reality. His memorial service was held there in 1904, and the facility was renamed in his honor. The building was designed and built in this Ruskinian Gothic style. And originally, it was estimated at costing $70,000 to complete. It almost actually cost $100,000 to complete, uh, which would be millions of dollars today. And the oak pews, as we'll see in the auditorium, are actually original. They underscore Ryman's religious beginnings and contribute to its warm sound and its feeling. So you can see this is a picture that uh, was taken they took the other a few years ago in the Ryman, and right next to it is a revival meeting. Um, these pews are still used today, and these are the seats. As you see live at the Ryman Auditorium, there are concerts continuously in Nashville all every night um, from country artists to worship artists to um, rock artists and folk singers and choirs. It is one of the most sought after rooms to perform in. Still has a stained glass and this is a, a panoramic shot so it's sort of stretched it out but that arch or that balcony is on a semicircle all the way across. And you can see again the different settings that the stage can be used for. Originally this was the house of the Grand Old Opry uh, since as they have moved that uh, that performance to uh, another location, but it is still used widely to this day. These revivals eventually spread inland from the East Coast as more and more settlers looked to the West for land. The settlers were more independently minded and less educated and less interested in traditional forms of liturgy. So the camp meeting revival development worked well. Preachers could come into an area, set up a tent, and spend several weeks inviting people from countryside uh, and from farms and hold worship services that were mainly oriented toward conversion. 
At the end of those meetings, the converted would organize a church, usually without a trained pastor. Some of these meetings were characterized by some pretty unusual occurrences. There are some unique spiritual manifestations that happened at these camp meetings. Uh, this one in Cane Ridge, Kentucky, actually is where the restoration movement draws some of its heritage. And we see these spiritual manifestations described by historian Henry Webb. First, the falling exercises, common to believers and unbelievers alike, wherein the victim would give a loud shriek and then fall to the floor, and remaining unconscious for an undetermined time. The jerks, usually violent backward and forward movement of the head, also sometimes the entire body was convulsing. There would be dancing, but this dancing exercise is usually preceded by the jerks, and it came to believers and occupied them until they collapsed from exhaustion. So dancing in the spirit. The barking exercise, this barking was a variety of, of, of the jerks where a person grunted or gasped audibly in the process. And it was so named by a contemptuous person who observed a man so convulsing and barking and leaning up on a tree. He described him as barking up a tree, the apparent origin of that expression. We see running. This running exercise was peculiar to unbelievers who feeling something unusual seizing them attempted to run away but then were felled and finally the singing exercise this was the most impressive of all to uh, alexander stone as he saw it his description follows the subject in a very happy state of mind would sing the most melodious not from the mouth or nose but entirely in the breast the sounds issuing thence such music silenced everything and attracted the attention of all it was most heavenly. The Cane Ridge Revival was a month long. It had 10,000 to 20,000 people. Preachers from various denominations came. Uh, Presbyterians, Reformed, Methodist. Uh, it was known as a Holy Spirit awakening, although it's not Pentecostal as we see it to this day. Uh, but there was a movement of uh, the Holy Spirit that caused these uh, people to respond to the gospel and to respond to the movement of the presence of God. And the Stone-Campbell movement can find some of its origins here. Let's talk um, briefly about the Restoration Movement, the Stone-Campbell movement. It's one of the significant movements that began in the American frontier period. And Nebraska Christian College and Hope International University can both trace their heritage to this movement. Uh, tired of the various denominations springing up during that time, a new movement sprang up to bring the church back to the practices of the ancient first century. They felt that unity could be realized if the Bible became the sole source of faith. So part of this movement grew out of the camp meeting again at, can at Cane Ridge, Kentucky. Uh, ironically, one group soon became three after a disagreement regarding worship practices and denominational structures. The Disciples of Christ groups grit split partly because they wanted a central missionary board, something other groups felt was going to lead them back to denominationalism. And so there is a Disciples of Christ, a, Christian, a Church of Christ known as the Disciples of Christ. It's considered mainline today. It's loosely a denomination because of this governing board that mainly sees missions, but also sees ordination. And, and there are um, Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ, um, schools and ordination mem um, ministering bodies. There's about 600,000 members to this day. The non-instrumental churches of Christ emerged because of opposition over the use of instruments in worship. Uh, they saw in the New Testament, as they said, they were going to look strictly at Scripture and see what the Bible said about worship. Since in the New Testament, there is, no, uh, there is only singing mentioned, but no instruments mentioned, they uh, saw that non-instrumental worship was the most biblically uh, modeled New Testament form of worship. So they withdrew from the group um, on their own after the post-Civil War. A lot of it is in the South, um, Nashville and Memphis, uh, 
have a lot of large non-instrumental churches, um, and there are still other churches of Christ, non-instrumental, throughout um, throughout the United States. But the, their main component, their theology is the same, but their main distinctive is that they still worship a cappella. And finally, we have independent Christian churches and churches of Christ. The They call themselves now Christian churches to separate themselves from the other churches of Christ that were non-instrumental. Um, they decided that they should have um, independent, autonomous churches with no denominational or, or governing board, but they also have, um, they do have singing and they focus on baptism of believers and the New Testament scripture as their worship um, guide. Various branches of the group has also been seen um, as they go and see how literal they want to use the scripture as their guide. One church in my hometown was created because a group felt that since the Last Supper used only one communion cup, the church should only use one as well. Other groups split over the issue of Sunday school. Since there is no mention of this in the Bible, it should not be included in the life of the church. Of the third group, this, is this independent Christian church group that we have, and they actually had one of the leaders, um, P.H. Walshmer in Canton, Ohio, at First Christian Church, had a Sunday school so large that more people were coming to Sunday school than coming to church or coming to the local elementary schools. At one point, they had over 5,000 coming to the Sunday school gathering, and it helped to develop the concept of Sunday school across the United States. The common emphasis of the Restoration Movement, the baptism of adults, New Testament pattern for conversion. They also have the Lord's Supper every Sunday, as often as you gather. They are independent congregations, so they are autonomous and no higher authority or overstructure or denomination, specifically with the independent Christian churches and the non-instrumental churches of Christ. And they are reticent to call themselves a denomination, even though they are linked together with uh, a lot of common theology and common heritage. More often, they will call themselves sister churches or a brotherhood or network of churches. Lastly, we see there is a local elder board, and that is the highest level of government authority, where it is a local elder board that oversees the local congregation. Last, let's take a look at the holiness movement, which begins to form out of these uh, revivals. And we start to see the development of this new Pentecostal movement at the turn of the 19th century into the 20th century. The holiness movement of this time would have had similar worship to the others, except the sermons weren't as much focused on evangelism. Calling the attendees to personal holiness was the goal. Complete consecration. Tarrying meetings became an important feature of their worship. So tarrying means waiting on the Holy Spirit to fall, right? And the glory we share as we tarry there, no other has ever known. This meeting took place on the Sunday afternoon or evening, these tarrying meetings. All right, and they would be separate from the morning worship gatherings. Here they would wait for the Holy Spirit to fall on them. Evidence of the Spirit included weeping, laughing, shaking, passing out, and eventually at the turn of the century, speaking in tongues. And this is the, per for the precursor to the Pentecostal movements of the 20th century. So as we look at these movements that happened with the first awakening, the second great awakening, the camp meetings and the revivals of the American frontier, we see nine principal characteristics. Again, these were growing out of various denominations and various movements. So as we look at what these characteristics were, also remember that the other more traditional characteristics of the denominations uh, from the Protestant movement would still be retaining their significant distinctions as well. But we see there are no set forms of worship. Uh, as they gathered at tent meetings and they gathered to 
Unitarian meetings, we would see there's no longer a liturgy or a set order or a set structure in these American frontier gatherings. There's also an infrequent observance of the ordinance. It wasn't necessarily about communion, although the independent Christian churches would have communion. It wasn't about ordaining pastors and ministers. It was about the gathering, the worship, the evangelism, and the waiting on the Holy Spirit. There was actually a suspicion of educated ministers who represented established churches because those churches would bring old theology, tradition, ritual that uh, the frontier worship thought was unnecessary. Frontier worship was very emotional, very um, spiritually driven, and, and not academic and not liturgical in the traditional sense. Preaching was still the primary emphasis, although worship and other expressions of, of uh, worship besides music were, were highlighted. Preaching was still the emphasis, whether it was to pr- pursue holiness or to bring the gospel to those listening and to convert people. Preaching was the primary component of these gatherings. Prayers were spontaneous and led by lay people as well as ministers. And there was informal enthusiasm. If you would go to a Presbyterian church in Philadelphia, for example, or you'd go to a Lutheran church in Baltimore, you would see very formal worship. You would see very controlled and structured moments of standing and sitting and singing and being quiet. These uh, frontier worshipers were anything but informal enthusiasm. There was exuberant singing. The songs were subjective and individualistic, yet buoyant and optimistic. No longer the sacred, theologically rich and staunchy hymns of the early Protestant movement. These songs became um, anthems and mantras and daily songs that would lift up the spirits and unite the community. There's also a spirit of immediacy. They wanted to know what works now? What works today? What do the local people, the communities, uh, the frontier people connect with? What are they allows them to connect with the Lord in their culture in that moment? And there was little interest in traditionalism or liturgy or ritual and what that had been done in the past. Finally, church buildings were harsh and plain as people developed and um, settled in the frontier Uh, The reality of having very few resources or having simple means allowed for simple buildings. There were no common worship books or prayer books in these frontier churches. And as uh, as churches would be established by denominations, they would bring their own liturgies and hymn books and prayer books with them. But a lot of these frontiers churches would have been established after a revival or a tent meeting and so the local gathering would just have their local uh, expressions worship it was informal spontaneous and evangelistic the church year virtually ignored all other dates except for christmas and easter and music was seen as the warm-up for the sermon we saw that in the sankey and moody era and in these tent revivals where music would stir people up would uh, ignite their emotions and unite them spiritually and then they would be um, ready to hear the call of the gospel they would be ready to hear about salvation they would be ready to hear that the holy spirit was moving them towards holiness i used to always uh, have this you know big fight against the idea of music being seen as the warm-up for the sermon. I thought that was minimizing of music, and as a worship pastor, I felt like that was the worst thing that we could do was to say we were the warm-up act for the preacher. Um, But the reality is, as I've gone to understand it more, music and worship allows us spiritually to open and center in on the God that we love and want to grow in and if we do not have an opportunity to open our emotions open our spirit open our soul to this things of the spirit the spiritual realm 
then the words that we are going to hear from the sermon are just going to be human words, and we're not going to hear the spiritual truth as much as if we recognize that music and worship uniquely prepares us and positions us to accept the truth of God through the sermon. So as as much as we don't want to see as the warm act, warm up act, there is a, a theological and um, spiritual reality that worship and music can do that no other uh, no other component can do. Here's some other characteristics of a frontier worship. As we see in this picture, it was a very meager um, and simple building, not ornate in any way. Uh, frontier churches had family pews or family pew boxes. Large churches, they were benched pews facing the stage. Uh, and these pew boxes, would uh, you could give specific money to have your family have a pew box. And then depending on where you were, there was a sense of uh, seniority or priority or prestige in some of these churches. But it also tells us that families gathered together, that families worshiped together in the room, and you grew up in a multi-generational congregation. Churches were designed, again, with an emphasis on preaching, much like before. But there was an individualistic emphasis on revivalism. The choir and the organ were moved from the side or the balcony to the stage because this music, again, was a large component of frontier worship of revival music and the communion table was moved to the back or to one side so we've seen the development from the communion being the center to the pulpit being the center and now the music is uh, centralized along with the preaching and communion is being moved off to the side uh, 